we looked at the timeless wisdom of the sages and saw its perfect application in the little details of our daily life. This week, to focus on thoughts from Ethics of the Fathers, we start studying this right after Passover, which means yesterday was the first Sabbath, the first Shabbos, directly after Passover. So we did the first chapter. The way Passover ended was on Thursday. So suddenly you like, boom, and there was Shabbos. But we did the first chapter, and there's always exactly six weeks, six Shabbos between Passover and Shavuot. So we have the six weeks for the six chapters of Ethics of the Fathers. And we continue studying it throughout the summer, which means we go through it another three times throughout the summer month until Rosh Hashanah. This coming week, which means this is the week of chapter two, everything in Ethics of the Fathers is, oh, that's talking about me. That's talking about my life. That's talking about things I need to know. Absolutely it is. As I said, it's timeless ancient wisdom that was, is, and always will be so, so applicable. First, we call these a Mishnah. In the first statement in this chapter two, so it says, Rebbe said, Rebbe, which means our teacher, which is a reference to the codifier of the Mishnah, whose name was Rebbe Huda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah, the prince. Under his jurisdiction, they, for the first time, codified the oral law. He said, this is it. If we don't codify it, we're going to lose it completely. So they codified the law very cryptically. And five out of the six chapters of Ethics of the Fathers are from that original codification. And therefore, he is referred to throughout the Mishnah as Rebbe, our teacher, as he was the ultimate teacher here and guide in the codification of the Mishnah, which we have discussed previously, this concept. The Rebbe said, what's the right path that a man should choose for himself? Well, everything that's beautiful to the one who does it and beautiful to him from man. All of these have myriads of levels of meaning. We're just going to be skating the surface, maybe a little bit underneath, maybe not even, but just to keep in mind that whatever we're saying is only one dimension of the many, many dimensions embedded in these statements. So beautiful. The true beauty of the world is actually the Torah. There's nothing more beautiful, more perfect, more magnificent than God's will and wisdom than the Torah. So the right path what do you mean the right path? The right path is serve God. The right path is do what God wants from you. Study his Torah. Do his commandments. I mean, we all know what the right path is. I don't need Rebbe, the great, great leader of world jewelry to say that. I could have answered that also. I could have answered that also. But Rebbe here is saying, no, there's a very special nuance in this question. We don't just mean what should man do. Man should do good and not bad. Man should serve God and not transgress. Man should do God's will and not do the opposite. You know, what Rebbe is saying is, the question is, what is the straightest path to bring the redemption? What's the direct road to redemption? Now, again, there are also many roads to redemption and they're all valid and they all work. But we want efficiency. We want the fastest, swiftest, easiest road that's going to make it happen. And Rebbe is saying that road is beauty. As I said, the beauty of the world, the most real beauty is time. So what's the swiftest road from all the possible roads to bring redemption? Oh, beauty. Specifically, Torah about redemption. As we study Torah about redemption, that is the most direct road to bringing redemption. So what's the world's beauty Torah? That's the path to create most efficiently, most smoothly, swiftly, easily redemption. Which of course is very practical for all of us because we all want to bring redemption. And the time is now. We actually happen to still be in the month of redemption, which is this Jewish month, Nisan, which ends this Friday. It's the month of miracles. I was like, okay, God, we've got to see these miracles. This is a month of miracles and it's a month of redemption. So what's the swiftest road to bring this redemption that we are all waiting for and longing and desperately need? The Torah, beauty. Torah about redemption, studying that Torah about redemption brings redemption. So that's the first thought here. Dixie, so glad you joined us. So glad you're able to make it. Yes, it's hard because it's, it's sun still shining and there's so much work to do on the ranch. So I was a little bit late, sorry. Wow. All right. By me, it's dark. What time is it by you? Six? Uh, uh, 5.30? Five to seven. Yeah. Yep. It just makes me rush. <laughs> well, you're prioritizing. You're putting God first. Saying, God, you know I have a lot of work to do, but I'm putting you first. Yep. I was sorry I was late, but I tried. <laughs> we he made it in. He appreciates that. He always appreciates when you put him first. That's what he wants from all of us. Like we all want. Yep. Like we all want. <laughs> we all want. We all want. 
So that was the first thought. So we're, we're looking at some ideas and ethics of the fathers, which we just started studying for the first time yesterday. And therefore now we're already focusing on chapter two. And that was from the first statement in chapter two, continuing in this first Mishnah. Again, each one of these little pieces of work we call a Mishnah, these inserts. So the second one is be careful in the performance of a seemingly minor commandment. Be as careful as if it's a, what you would do as major commandment because you don't know. So that's the second idea. So the first idea we connected to redemption and we said, what is the straightest way to bring redemption? The easiest way, the fastest way? Study about it. As you study about redemption, you bring redemption. Hi, Natalie. So glad you're able to join. And the second thing we're saying here is be careful in all the little details that you might have the tendency, that we might have the tendency to undervalue. And we could think in our lives, so many times we do things and it's like, oh, it was a little thing. And we did it. It's not like we didn't do it, we did it. But we don't value it. We don't realize what we're really accomplishing. And therefore some people, or maybe us sometimes, don't do it. I'm sure you've caught yourself, I definitely have caught myself, we're like, I'm usually careful about something and I don't know what's going on. I'm busy and I don't know whatever, whatever else is going on. I'm like, ah, you know, I'm like, no, 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 don't lose it. Don't give yourself excuses. Don't slack off. Anyone has had that experience in a certain area where they like have a tendency to allow themselves or struggle not to be convinced that it's not a big deal because it's such a small deal anyway. <laughs> Dessert. <laughs> Me meaning, meaning controlling yourself from not overeating and then just saying whatever. Oh, totally. No, I just got the speech from the midwives last week about cutting back on sweets, but sure. this baby really wants sweets. So it's a bit of a challenge. Okay. So your midwives it's are saying it's a big but... deal. It's not a small deal. Exactly. It's the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> okay. No, because we all have things that we tell ourselves such a big deal. Why do I have to be so careful? Who else is so careful? Nobody else does it or whatever, you know, but we're saying, no, we have no clue to God. What's a big deal. You no, know, it's very interesting. I was, I was with my family, my children over Passover and we spent a long time like families do just talking and sharing memories. Very beautiful, very special. And it was so interesting. The things my children share that they remembered for good or for bad, that many of it were things I was like, I mean, I don't remember at all. Like it was very low on my radar. It was so low. I don't even know what they were talking about. I made a very deep impression on that. And that's what happens. And it happens with God also. So sometimes we're doing something and it doesn't make a very big impression on us. We don't think of it as so valuable and God thinks it's really valuable. Or sometimes we don't do what we should do, convincing ourselves it's not so important. And to God, it really is important. Someone else can think of an area that they struggle to remember is important, or they sometimes find themselves thinking isn't so important, but then they know it really is because everything is. Well, I can say that um, sometimes I think it's important to be prepared. And then I think I'm prepared. And then I get to something and all of a sudden I see I'm really not prepared. And it makes me so sad because I wasn't paying attention. Because you know, to me, it wasn't more important enough to be sure I was prepared. And that really bothers me because God puts things in front of us to help others and everything. And I try and be prepared. I try to have money available that I can hand it out the window or whatever if I see somebody that needs it. And I was at the coin shop and this man was in front of me and he had, I mean, holes in his pants. He was, he was clean and his beard was beautiful, but he got to tell me a story. He told the man in front of me first. He was obviously mentally handicapped because I guess somebody was raping his wife and he came in and they beat him senseless and they about killed him. And he left his body, he said, three times when the surgeons were working on him. And he said he could hear everything and everything. And they said he was going to die. And but he came back and uh, he's homeless now. And I mean, it's so it broke my heart. And he's so kind and he's so nice. 
and he was trying to get, I think trade he had some some coin or something he was trying to get money for because he had none he'd been homeless for nine months and he said the people that he lived with for a while had um, it didn't work out they were horrible people he said and they robbed him and uh, so he had m nothing left and if he well, I, I thought I need to give him something and about the time I thought that he that the guy took him in and I thought I wished when he came out I should have said wait you know wait stop but then the guy was motioning me in so I couldn't and I was just so sad that I was because after I got in there I realized I couldn't have given it anyway because I wasn't prepared I didn't have the extra money and yeah definitely if we if someone crosses our path we we want to do our part we want to do whatever we can and every little bit of kindness is is something and it's worthwhile and definitely, I, I, I hear what Dixie's saying, that someone could say, ah, hey, not so important, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, no. And Dixie's like, no, this is this is very important. And this is, this is everything's the hand of providence. Everything's the hand of God. Who you see, who you meet, and that you can do something to alleviate someone else's pain. I, I totally hear you. Wow, it's pretty intense. Someone else, some other things you're struggling with that you could tell yourself, like, you know, maybe something simpler than Dixie said, like remembering to make those blessings and telling yourself it's really little and then remembering that it's really not little, it's really big or something like that. Or maybe sometimes nuances of honesty that like we can like convince ourselves that eh, it's okay, everyone does, it's not such a big deal. But then under that, we know it actually really is a big deal. I would I like say it. pretty much every night I think about this. Oh, okay. <laughs> as I, as I'm getting you must ready be to the bed, reason why I'm saying it then. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking like, oh, you know, I could have been more, more intentional with this or this. And I know that God wants this for me. I know this is important. But as the day is happening and as I'm, I think I'm so busy, right? <laughs> that I, I let the other things consume my day. Um sometimes when I know that, you know, I should pray more, study more, or focus on certain things. Um, you know, it's certainly at night when I'm reflecting and, and thinking about my day where I'm like, oh, I knew I should have been more intentional and, um, you know, tried to do better the next day. But there's an endless list of things I could list for you. <laughs> okay, you definitely know what I'm talking about. Yes, there is an endless list. And yes, it does seem like there's a lot of little things that we could always, like Danielle's saying, we could, we're, we're all master jugglers. We all want to make sure nothing crashes. And sometimes we we prioritize the wrong ball. You know, sometimes we like like you all know the famous parable of, you know, what's gonna go in that jar, you know, and what what are the significant pieces that you have to put in first because they have to be there. And and obviously people might have very different lists of what are those significant pieces, or you know, so we, we could see this person spends hours doing this or this or this, this, you know, all these people. And it's like, whoa, how do you have time for all that? Well, I would never have time for that. Well, that's obviously not important enough for me to want to have time for that. But sometimes, unfortunately, the details of serving God might be things we want to do, we believe in. But since we put a few other things first and then a few other things first and then a few other things first and then the day goes and then like, oh, no. That was important. That wasn't supposed to get lost in the shuffle, but somehow it did again. So sometimes, exactly. sometimes yeah. for that, the best way is to like shift the whole planning of the day and say like, this has to happen before if it's a thing like, like prayers or study. Sometimes like you're saying it's an intention, it's a focus. And then it's just really like saying, no, this is a day where I'm going to look back on today and I'm going to say, yes, I focused on I was mindful. I was present. I gave to my children, you know, whatever it is, and really have that as like a focal point of what is going to at least I'm doing it this day, today. And then, then the next day you tell yourself the same thing just for today, just for today. I want to make it a meaningful day. I want to make it count. But I'm sure we all have, like Danielle, or like Natalie said, or like Dixie said, you know, we all have those things either those recurring things or not that we definitely need to not let become small in our eyes because in God's eyes, they're big. <laughs> of course, the, the flip side of that is understanding that sometimes we do lots of good things that we don't think are so special and we don't think it's so valuable and God really does. 
And God really appreciates. And God's really grateful that we're working for him. So that was the second thought in this first, as we call it, Mishnah from chapter two. The third thought is following along the theme, consider the law incurred in the performance of a commandment against the reward earned by its observance. And conversely, the gain derived from a sin against the loss that will follow. Meaning... What we're being told here is sometimes we don't do something good because it's like a uh, law. Is it a financial loss? Is it a loss of time? You know, is it if I do this, something else isn't going to happen? There's reasons why there's good things we know about and don't do. Obviously, some things are ignorant. But once we're past that, once we have the knowledge, well, there was a reason why we didn't do that good thing. There would be a loss we would incur by doing that good thing. So we didn't do it. So Rabbi Huda and Nasi, Judah the prince, is saying, okay, it might have a law. Think of the loss versus the gain, versus the value, the infinitesimal work. Like taking Danielle's example, pray. Now you know God wants you to pray. God wants to hear your voice every day. What's the loss? Here it might not be exactly a financial loss, but it's maybe it's a loss of sleep. If I pray, that means I've got to get up earlier to fit that into my day or loss of time that I would be doing something else. Maybe I'd be having a more leisurely breakfast, a shower, um, um, you know, working out, exercising, more time to contemplate, reflect on my thoughts, read the paper. I don't know what people do in the morning. So there's a loss. Well, if I do this, I won't have time to do that. Okay. Rabbi Nasi says, all right, there's a loss. Now compare that to the game. How could you compare the loss of a few more minutes of your sleep or your the morning shower or the morning exercise routine, the morning newspaper, for the morning coffee versus the gain of talking to God in the morning. And conversely, he's saying, flipping it around the other way, is there a gain when you transgress God's will? Well, yeah, you think there's a gain. That's why you're doing it. The gain could be indulgence, could be pleasure. It could just be like, you know, go back to what Natalie said about the dessert. <laughs> You know, when you eat something that you know you shouldn't eat, you sometimes let yourself deliberately space out and not think about it. But even if you have those creeping thoughts as you're eating, you just like push them aside, you know, whatever. Now you just want to enjoy yourself. You'll deal with it later. So he's saying, really? The gain, like we're going to say, take Natalie's example, the gain of that, that dessert, of that indulgence, of that sweet, and the loss, you know, whatever the loss would be in terms of your health, in terms of, any other situation, reason why this is not good for you? That game really worth that loss? So the two sides, the loss incurred in serving God and the game, that game really overwhelms that loss. As versus if we're struggling with doing something wrong, what's the gain I get by doing that wrong? And what's the loss? Now, of course, this asks us, this is so logical, it's so simple, but it's requiring us to be very, very, very mindful, very focused, very mentally driven people. Most of us are not. <laughs> Most of us are far more instinctive, emotionally oriented. But if we're really doing things mindfully, it's so, it's so logical. Has anyone here ever used these thoughts to help them in either direction? Meaning like when they're struggling with doing something they know they shouldn't do, just stop and think about the gain versus the loss in doing this or conversely on the side of good. When they don't want to do something, stop and think, okay, I don't want to do it because that's my loss. But think of anyone have to use this in either direction? I do a lot. I have a bad habit of procrastinating. And so consequently, I have a lot of lost time and I'm trying to get better about organizing. I read a book, it was by Ariel Barzada, and he said, when you start your day, make your list and pray to God that you can follow this list. And um, it's really kind of helping it because it makes me focus on what I want to do during the day. I don't get on so many rabbit trails. I think about, well, that's not on my list, so I need to focus. I think Danielle is like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you and I. Yes, Dixie. I, like, oh I my agree. gosh, Dixie, do you have like cameras in my house? How do you know what I go through? What's going on? <laughs> Great minds think alike. No, it's <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad it helped. And yeah, we all, we all need just to keep that focus because yes, definitely, like you said, it's a lot of rabbit trails, a lot of just distracting things aren't bad, but they do hurt us because then we don't get to do the good that we need to be doing. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, for me, like the flip side example was um, when I, I had, so when I had my first son, I ended up having to have a C-section. And so in an effort to try to not have another C-section, <laughs> my midwives had basically said like, no sugar, no carbs for the whole pregnancy, right? Which was tough. Like it was really, really, really hard. But keeping that end goal in mind of like, a, you know, a better delivery was, you know, made it, you know, made, made it more able to keep that discipline. And so it's like this time I didn't have that like requirement, like, oh, you know, you can't eat this right from the get go. Whereas now it's like, okay, you're halfway through. All right. Time to cut out the carbs and the sugar. It's like, oh, darn. <laughs> Listen, halfway through, you got at least you got like four and a half months of carbs and sugars. <laughs> so, I did. Uh, very, very wonderful, like matzo chocolate cake. Yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's true. I mean, for all of us, I think I think for the whole world, you know, we all understand long and short term short term goals, and this leads to this for good or for bad. And the gain and the loss for good or for bad but again it requires us to stay mindful focused you know i liked what dixie said make your schedule and pray to god that you will succeed with it so there's making the schedule and then there's being vulnerable and understanding that we're where our schedule is only a piece of paper or something on our phone you know we're we're very human and you know this this task of being focused and mindful and weighing and going for the ultimate good and not the short-term losses it's um we definitely need god's help absolutely <clears throat> absolutely last section of this first mishnah in chapter two reflect upon three things and you will not come to sin Know what is above you, an eye that sees, an ear that hears, and all your deeds are recorded. All your deeds are recorded in a book. So again, here we're being told, <coughs> again, the same idea, if we can be, you know, all of this has, as I said before, myriads of deeper levels of thought that I'm not going into. But just on this very, surface level this is a very powerful concept reflect there's an eye that's always watching there's an ear that's hearing everything is being recorded the Babacharava spoke many times about this idea of bringing a moment of silence into the public schools that the children should start their day with prayer a moment of silence because we're not instructing what someone else should pray we don't want to impose God forbid religion on anyone, but we want to give children an opportunity to talk to God every single day. As the Rebbe says, we want them to go home and ask their parents, what should they be doing during this minute? And what does this mean? And what's this idea of prayer? And what's this idea of God? Which could be in the most simple way, exactly this concept. There's an eye that sees and an ear that hears. Everything's being recorded. Everything's significant. Everything's being noted. If you're focused that God is watching, how would you behave? Well, he is. Like a great, great sage of the Jewish people, his name was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Literally, the leader of world Jewry, saved and preserved the spiritual legacy of the Jewish people after the destruction of the Second Temple. And when he was passing away, his students said, bless us. And he said, I bless you. You should fear God like you fear a person. And they're like, what? That's the ultimate blessing of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the leader of world Jewry on his deathbed? Fear God like we fear a person? And he said, well, if you know a person's watching, you're not going to mess up. God's always watching. If you have just that sense of God like, like a person watching, Think how much differently you're going to behave. And the Baba Tareb, again, really echoed this theme in saying, if we give the children this time every day to reflect, they'll have a very simple takeaway. 
This world is not a jungle. Because unfortunately, when you don't have that moment of sight, and you don't have built into their system time to reflect and communicate with God, they do believe the world is a jungle. They do believe the biggest bully wins. And that is why we see these horrors, these shootings and murders in the school systems that's coming from children who were never gifted to have a real focus on the awareness of God. Of course, every human innately believes in God. But some people live in environments where that belief is so shut down, so choked out of them. So they, they lose it. They lose touch with what they really believe and who they really are. And these little six-year-olds can become murderers. So knowing there's an eye that sees, there's an ear that hears, all your deeds are recorded. All right, well, then you can live a very different life. You're gonna have a life aware that God is watching you and needs you and needs your service. And that could totally transform a person's life. Just that simple thought. So these are all little ideas within the first Mishnah. First set of statements of chapter two. Go to the third one. Be wary of those in power. For they befriend a person only for their own benefit. They seem to be friends when it is to their advantage, but they do not stand by a man in his hour of need. So, of course, you could say, well, nothing to do with me. I don't know anyone in power anyway. <laughs> but it really, in a sense, could apply to all of our tendency to rely and believe on people as our saviors, as our salvation, as our support. And in general, we have to now know no, nope. not just because man's fickle, not just because man's not trustworthy, because man's not our support, man's not our background. God is. So we're thinking, oh, I'm in this crunch situation, but so-and-so can help me. She's got a lot of connections. She's got great ideas. She'll know how I can get a loan. She'll know how to arrange this government program. She'll know how I can get that equipment I need for my house. We can obviously turn to people for help, but not believe in them as a source of help, not believe they're powerful people and they're the source of power. Because we believe and we know and we trust in God. Anyone had an experience recently or that comes to their mind where they really consciously stepped away from people as power and focused on God as power and saw that he came through? It happens to me every day. Every day. So, you have so many people that want to control you and you just got to step away. You've got to say that's not right. That's they're not their teachings, not right. You know, or even friends that want to not intentionally control you but they do because they want for the best of you it's not that they want but you to me i have my own decisions and i can't constantly be thinking that i have to follow what my friends or whatever the government or whatever's thinking you know because it's control and not that they want to be bad they want to help but it's still control well as long as you can always see it so clearly you probably don't get trapped. Sometimes not. it's not sometimes it's not as clear. Anyone no, else sees themselves struggle with that or overcome that or not? Yes, and uh, for me it's been uh, uh, I'm the enemy. <laughs> I'm the control to uh, everything. And I used to plan everything, you know, I have, I have plan A, plan B, plan C. If this this didn't work is next and uh, next till meaning it has to be my way and then i learned that no uh, our heavenly father is in charge and whatever is going to happen is based on his will not on my wants or needs or uh, anxious or whatever i think and no it's not so today i'm relaxed and uh, uh pray that you know but as, as you said, it's important to focus. Once you focus and let it go and trust our Heavenly Father that he's going to 
provide whatever is necessary for me to uh, get or uh, have whatever I is uh, I I need in that moment. Not because not what I want is what I need. Then uh, I learn to let it go. I mean, I'm not anxious anymore. Uh, getting sick, uh, you know, because things are not coming the way I want it, etc. So now I'm relaxed. Uh, I learned to relaxing is part of my happiness. You are so right. You are so right. Everything you're saying is so strong. We're talking about power and not trusting in people as the power. She is right. The biggest, I don't want to say, uh, um, protagonist, the biggest challenge is ourselves. For yeah. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. It takes a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience to really give it up, let it go, trust in God. Same way you're not turning to people as this person's going to protect me with their influence, with their knowledge, with their connections, and me as well giving it over to him very deep hard and as Ruth said ultimately very happy and free work Natalie what were you gonna add sorry it wouldn't let me unmute there for a second and I was gonna throw in there that so I like to keep up with the news but it's always no matter who you listen to it's doom and gloom right it's the worst day ever and it's just the worst of the worst is always happening and for me it's like it's it, I like to keep up with the current event but I just don't let it phase me because I'm like think about what was happening I mean Esther is my absolute favorite story in the Bible. And for me, it's just, it's always, always, always a case of like, yeah, they were facing the worst of the worst, the absolute worst of the worst. And God managed to turn all of it around in a way that nobody was expecting. So to me, I'm, I'm kind of always in this idea of like, okay, maybe this isn't good or maybe that's not so good, but really like matter what's going on, God's still in control. And yeah, people can make bad decisions, right? Haman was still making bad decisions and the king was still making bad decisions, but God ultimately turned it around for his own purpose anyway, even when people in power were making bad decisions. So for me, it's just kind of a way to not get hung up on the bad news every day kind of a thing. That's a great concept. The story of Purim is such a great uh, mirror image of this idea of a lot of power in, with a lot of abuse of power. And guess what? It didn't make a difference. It didn't make a difference. It goes back to God's plan that God can take all those abuses and actually use them and turn them around and make it to his clear benefit. And that's also good, just that thought in general, what Dali was saying for so much in our life. Like you could say, but how can God solve it? This is unsolvable. You know, this is too hard for him. This is just not fixable. This is just a mess. This is just not going anywhere good. Hey, really? You're limiting God's creativity? You're limiting God's ability? You're thinking God can't handle this? This one's too hard for him? This one somehow matters even though he creates the world and runs every detail, but somehow this one was out of control? We trust. We have optimism. We have joy. I was that trust and optimism and joy. We move forward and try, like Ruth said, not to serve ourselves too much either, to give just more room for God and more trust in God. And the more we give room for God and the more we trust God, the more we'll see God beneficent unfolding. In details we might view as so small, we're shocked he's bothering. And in details we might understand to be very, very, very big.